Foundry family, it's good to be with you this weekend, or at least be with you virtually. That's kind of been uh, our norm over the last, uh, man, several months, uh, unfortunately. But just so grateful for Pastor Scott uh, for this invitation uh, and for the opportunity to uh, just be in relationship with you guys uh, at the Foundry uh, and for you guys to be in support of our uh, church plant, Hope Baltimore, here in the city of Baltimore. Uh, and hey, you know what, speaking of partnering and being in relationship, uh, grateful for my uh, Epiphany Baltimore fam as well, who are allowing me to record this message here at their lab. So shout out to Pastor Charlie and Pastor Trev, uh, as we are all co-laboring together in this city to do what God has called us to do. And so I'm excited to be a part of what you guys have already started and we appreciate uh, your support. Listen, if you have a Bible, if you can meet me in uh, the book of Nehemiah, or maybe you've got a Bible app or whatever you use, we'll, we'll land right in Nehemiah chapter one as we're kicking off a new series through the book of Nehemiah. And I'm honored to be kicking this series off uh, for you guys at the Foundry. We'll get to Nehemiah one in just a second, but uh, as I was reading, preparing and praying, uh, for this message, I was reminded of my son, Isaiah, my only son. I have four kids. He's my only boy. And uh, Isaiah brings a different energy to our house, as you might imagine. Um, he feels the need, and maybe this is because he's the only boy and he's got three sisters, two older sisters, a younger sister, but he feels the need to assert himself very aggressively, I might add. He's very demanding, he's loud, um, but he's a good boy. But something that I noticed is that Isaiah has no issue of making his request known to me very, very directly and aggressively. And he has total confidence that whatever he asks, I can and will do, or at least attempt to do. And no, no, no matter what he asks me, he has total confidence that I can make or build or whatever he has in his mind. Um, and I appreciate that and I'm humbled by that. Um, I know at some point he's gonna be disappointed that I actually can't do all of the things that he envisions uh, in his mind. But like most children and human nature, success for Isaiah is the outcome that he has envisioned in his mind. Particularly if there's a problem or a situation has come up, he has the idea, he has the solution, he has the way that it needs to get done and he's looking for it to get done in that particular way. And if the outcome isn't what he envisions in his mind, then that's a problem. And I know everyone who either has kids or uh, works with kids or engages with kids, you know that that's par for the course. But here's the thing, even as adults, so when we evolve in our lives, we're never too far removed from our four and five year old selves, where success for us is how we uh, view it in our mind and we want our way, we have our ideas of how things are supposed to happen, particularly when there are moments of discomfort, distress, and disasters. Moments like we've had over the last year and a half or so dealing with COVID-19, stuff hits our life and we don't know what to do. We don't know how to address it, but we know that it needs to get fixed. And I'm sure all of us have some idea, some semblance of how we want it to be fixed. We're, we're not sure how it can be, but we, we know we don't want it to look like this. And then there are some of us who uh, have a relationship with God and some of us who even call him Heavenly Father. We know that we can call on him uh, in prayer uh, to make our request known to fix this thing that we've got a problem with. And here's the thing though, when we're making that request, we usually have in our mind exactly how we want that thing to be resolved. That is success in our mind. And I was thinking about this in relationship to Nehemiah chapter number one and just Nehemiah's story I was thinking about how Nehemiah is in this desperate situation at the opening of Nehemiah 1. It's a dire situation. The nation of Israel 
um, has gone from a family in Genesis connected to or flowing out of Abraham's family to a nation in Egypt, although they were oppressed, they multiplied in Egypt and became a nation. And then they became a kingdom as Joshua and the book of Joshua led them in to the promised land and all be it a divided kingdom, they became a kingdom. And now they are a scattered remnant who has been exiled. This writing of Nehemiah at this particular time is called the post-exilic period, meaning after they have been exiled. Now they have been exiled because they were divergent in terms of the expectation that God had given to them through Moses. And uh, they had gone down a different path and as a result of that, they were scattered and they were removed and, and uh, carried off into exile away from their normalcy, away from their home, away from uh, what they would have known. And so this is not a good time for them uh, and they are coming back from that exile. Now, I, I need to just put a pin right here because it's not an apples to apples comparison, but, but I feel like over the last year and a half, we too uh, maybe feel a little bit uh, like exiles. Um, maybe we're not removed from our homes and maybe we're not uh, removed from uh, uh, the, the immediate normalcy, but the normalcy of our lives uh, the, the connectivity of, of people that we've been in fellowship and relationship with maybe work or church or some other uh, groups in which we gather, we have been removed from that. We've been removed from our sense of normalcy. And for quite a while, it was a little bit dire for us and definitely disastrous as we've lost loved ones and friends. And um, there's been suffering as a result of COVID-19. And so we're now kind of entering into this somewhat return, um, kind of sort of back into normalcy and, and kind of sort of uh, back to maybe a new normal, not, not what it used to be. And I was working out in the gym uh, this week and I heard this new term called FOGO, the, the fear of going out. And so even people, as we think about this return, you know, have some sense of fear of reconnecting. And so, uh, as we think about this in terms of, 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 of what Nehemiah is presenting here, this is, this is not a great time for, uh, for Israel and its people. And, and Nehemiah is a Jew, and he's serving as a cupbearer to a Persian king, Artaxerxes. And this is present-day Iran, and to be a cupbearer meant that he was to drink um, whatever the king was drinking, uh, to make sure that he wasn't getting poisoned. So he's in a trusted position. He's, he's close to the king and he has influence. And Nehemiah gets word from his homeboy that uh, his people are, are, are broken down. The city is vulnerable. The city gate has been burned, which is a bad thing, which meant that the people are vulnerable. But what struck me about this whole situation is not what Nehemiah did, but what Nehemiah didn't do. And I'm, I'm making the correlation to where we are right now in, in our life and time, because I think Nehemiah gives us a little bit of a blueprint, a little bit of a game plan in terms of how we are to react when we are challenged um, in certain ways. How do we respond when stuff hits our lives in an uncertain way? Or, or how do we proceed when our community and our city and our world around us is not well? What do we do when there's discomfort and distress and disaster like we've experienced through COVID? I wanna zoom in and, and unpack what Nehemiah shows us. And, and let's pick this up in verse number four through the end of Nehemiah one. I'm reading from the CSB version. You can follow along with me. It says, when I heard these words, this is Nehemiah talking, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you uh, day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. 
We have acted corruptly toward you and have not kept your commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you have commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I choose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You, deem, you redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. As we think about what we just read, there are a lot of things here that we can really unpack, but I, I just want to zoom in on just a, a few points. Right off of the bat here in Nehemiah uh, 1 verse 4, we see three things that Nehemiah did. He lamented, he fasted, and he prayed. Lamented meaning he wept, okay, then he fasted and he prayed. Now, these three things are significant for us, but let me just point out the fact that I think that we are more comfortable with the idea of prayer and we, we know a little bit more about that and you know where we place prayer on the front end or the back end you know we can discuss that later but but we're familiar with prayer that's that's kind of that like let me make a phone call mode you know some some has come up like I, I need to make a call and so them, some some of us understand the importance and the power of, of that communication through prayer but but the one thing that that or, or the two things that I don't think we're as familiar with or don't show up as much in our lives is this idea of lamenting and fasting and so let's just unpack that for just a second. I think it's important for us to understand the power of lament because when we lament, we're lamenting on behalf of uh, and with. And that's a, that's a powerful thing. This, this idea of lamenting, it draws in our heart and it helps us to feel and it activates our empathy. Now, you all know that we could definitely use a little bit more empathy in our world and an execution that flows out of empathy. Now, now let me break this down for just a second. Sympathy feels bad for. Empathy feels bad with. Now, I'm not suggesting that there isn't a place for sympathy. I'm, I'm just saying that, that what, what lamenting is about is more about empathy because you are identifying with. And oh, by the way, the tradition of the church flows out or is connected to this idea of lamenting on behalf of and with. If we fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus even said there's a blessing associated with lamenting. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then Paul says that there's an obligation that we have. He says that we should mourn with those who mourn. Listen, how much more would our impact and our efforts in the world be if we had less sympathetic solutions and more empathetic execution. I'm gonna say that again. If we had less sympathetic solutions and more empathetic execution. This is certainly the case from an empathy standpoint of what we see in Nehemiah. And, and throughout the series, you will unpack a little bit more in terms of exactly what he did. But Nehemiah acts empathetically in this case, and I think it's significant because we must understand that Nehemiah is disconnected uh, personally from what's happening. He's not in the place. He's not one of the exiles. He's actually in a place of privilege. He's removed. He's kicking it in the king's palace. He got a good government job. So at the end of the day, like he doesn't have to get involved in this way. He doesn't have to do anything. He could write a check and send money, send supplies, but this is, it, this is not eventually what Nehemiah does. The second thing it says that he does is that he fasts. Now, 
just to be transparent, this is a spiritual discipline that I personally need to be more committed to because fasting, it, it helps to produce clarity in our lives and it's, it's putting our sole attention on hearing from God. And, and fasting is this posture that says, you God are greater than anything I can consume. Give me all of you in this moment. But listen, the pace of our on-demand world kind of resorts us to this pseudo-engagement with God. And it's often because we don't create or have enough margin in our lives to commune with God uh, in this particular way. We resort to the pursuit and the prioritization of resources instead of the source. So our money, our friends, our relationships, the things and people that we are connected to, we, we, we put more emphasis and priority in that, but, but those are resources, meaning they come from a source, and the source is God. Finally, it says that Nehemiah, he prays. So he laments, he fasts, and he prays. And I wanna zoom in on how he prays for, for just a moment, because I, I think it's, it's significant. Because what Nehemiah doesn't say versus what he says, I think is significant here. So in this prayer, Nehemiah does three things. The, the first thing he does is he confesses the sins of Israel, which is his own uh, specific lamenting here. He says, we, Israel, have sinned. This is collective, we. And then he says, me and my family have sinned. This is individual. And this is significant because what we tend to do when stuff happens is we're so focused on the problem and how it needs to be fixed, but not how we arrived at the problem and how we have contributed to the problem. And what confession does it, it, it's, it's this part of lamenting that says that we are in this together, that there's somehow, some way that, that I am uh, connected to what is happening here. And Nehemiah, listen, he was not directly responsible for Israel's exile. He was not directly responsible for the situation itself, but he knows that he has sinned, his family has sinned, and he is not completely innocent. There's biblical precedent, my friends, for this confession and lamenting piece that becomes a foundational part of rebuilding, a foundational rebuilding block. Lamenting and confessing our sins for those who've gone before us and our own. And let me just bring this home as we look at the, 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 the divide uh, racially, eth ethnically, culturally, like in our, in our society. Right? We got a lot of, hey, this is how we need to fix the problem. This is, this is what we need to do. But we don't have a lot of us coming together saying, hey, you know what? We have all sinned. Matter of fact, we have some people saying, well, those were my ancestors that did that. And I just have to say that, that the, the, the black community especially is disappointed at times when there isn't this feeling of, we are in this with you. And, and that, that is the place, and that is a tradition that the church should know well. And so Nehemiah displays this for us. And the question might be, well, how long do we need to lament? And how long do we need to engage in this way? Well, I would say how long, however long is necessary. Because when there's trauma and when there are things that happen, we would never say to a trauma victim, how long are you going to have PTSD as a result of this thing? No, it's uh, we are in this with you. We are lamenting with you and we are walking beside you. We need empathy as part of our execution. And it's an ongoing thing. The second thing we see here is after the, the confession, Nehemiah reminds God of his commandments and his promises. And this is important because Nehemiah is praying God's word back to him. Now, listen, I talked about my kids earlier and I, you know, if you guys have any experience with kids, even if you're not a parent, you better not promise a kid something and not deliver. 
because they will remind you. Listen, there's nothing that gets me more, moves me more than when my kids say, but daddy, you said. Well, now I got to be accountable to what I said. And what, what Nehemiah is recalling here, what he's echoing is Leviticus 26, where God said, listen, I will scatter you if you don't follow this plan. This is what's in store for you if, if you don't uh, follow what I put before you. And that's exactly what happened. But he also said that if you return, then listen, I will gather you and I will restore you. And this is what Nehemiah is communicating. Listen, we must be aware of the covenant promises that God has made us. And these not only become things that we can stand on and, and, and draw our hope from, but these are also things that we can recall back to God in our communication and our prayer to him. Nehemiah also understands that this is not just about rebuilding a city. He understands that this is a moment about rebuilding people and a people coming together. So Nehemiah, he, he confesses his sins, his family sins, the nation's sins, and then he recalls God's commandments and promises back to him. And then lastly, and I love this, Nehemiah asked God for compassion. And this is significant here. He says, yes, God, give me success, but then also give me compassion. But listen, he didn't ask God to bless an agenda he laid out before him. It, it, it doesn't say anywhere where Nehemiah presented a plan to God, where he, where he specifically asked God to do this or that, or he brought any of his ideas or his strategy before God. I'm not suggesting that that's bad. I'm just saying here that Nehemiah generally understood that God's compassion on him and before him would be significant. And what it shows us is that Nehemiah wanted God's, God's heart and his will and not his own. And he wanted God to go before him and his actions demonstrated that. Now, if you notice, when, we end, when, when, when the chapter ends, Nehemiah says, give me compassion before this man. So this is a teaser to what's going to happen in chapter two, which I'm sure Pastor Scott um, uh, will get into uh, moving forward. But, but, but uh, Nehemiah is going to get his opportunity with uh, King Artaxerxes. But too many times we're thinking about our plans and our agendas and we're focused on our requests when we get the opportunity as opposed to asking and seeking God for what he desires and asking for his compassion before we have these moments. It's about God going before us and then giving us compassion and favor with those who we will go before. Let me see if I can land the plane for us like this this weekend and, and bring this home as we think about our own communities, as we think about Baltimore and the surrounding areas, and we think about uh, those who are, are in relationship uh, with us in somehow, uh, somehow, some way. There's no doubt that we've got a lot of rebuilding to do. There, there's no doubt that there's, there's plenty of work ahead. And no doubt uh, our city, uh, its people, and the people of God, even within the church, the fractions and the division, there's no doubt that there needs to be a recalibration. But here's the thing. It requires both prayer and action. And just in case you missed the point, I wanted to emphasize it in what I'm wearing today. It requires prayer and action. And the book of Nehemiah is a book that shows us both but shows us in which the order they should go, just as it is printed on my shirt. And here's the thing. We tend to be heavy on the prayer side of things. You know, when it gets messy and the block gets hot and stuff is happening and the bullets are flying, we don't want to be in the middle. Of that. It's a little bit too messy. So I'm going to pray. And you know, we, we'll, we'll say things like, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to pray for you, which sometimes is translation with, you know what? God bless you but I ain't gonna get in it with you. Or 
We then tend to be heavy on the action side of things when we're looking for quick solutions or we're acting out of our emotions uh, and, and we, we need things to happen right now. We tend to jump to action too quickly before prayer. But here's the thing. The order is significant because prayer needs to inform our action. And prayer is the process that gets us ready beforehand. It's called preparation, coming from the root word prepare. Now, I just happened to study English uh, in college. Uh, so I love linguistics, I love etymology, uh, and all of those sorts of things. And so when you, when you look up the word prepare, it comes from this Latin word um, that, that has a root word that means to bring about. Okay, and so we know the, the prefix pre means before. So, so, so to bring about before is literally what, what it means in Latin. So what prayer does is it not only informs our action, it brings about God's intended outcome beforehand. So we're, we're literally opening the door for God's intended outcome before we even do what we do. It's God going before us. And so many times, those who've read the book of Nehemiah, who are familiar with Nehemiah's story, we fast forward, hold on, spoiler alert, the wall is rebuilt in 52 days. Sorry, Pastor Scott, if you want me to hold that back, but, but the wall is built in 52 days. Everybody focuses on the administration. Wow, such great leadership, amazing miracle, 52 days. But before that, several days of lamenting, fasting, and praying. And did you know that from the time Nehemiah prays to the time he gets before Artaxerxes is actually four months. So here's the thing. What we do beforehand is significant. And, and I know that we uh, want to be people of action and we cannot be afford, we cannot afford to be people who are not of action. But here's the thing, both inaction and ignorant action, void of prayer, falls short and oftentimes does damage. So, so here's the point. At the end of the day, where we are right now in this moment of time, with the fractions that we're seeing, within the church, within our community, within the city, politically, racially, ethnically, culturally. We've got to be people of both prayer and action like Nehemiah demonstrates for us. Confessing our sins and those who have sinned before us, calling God on his commands and reminding him of his promises and asking for compassion and favor as we go about doing the business and the work that God has called us to here in our communities, in our cities, in our families and beyond. That's my prayer for us as churches in the city, those who are laboring together. And that's my prayer for you uh, individually as well. And I just want to pray for you uh, as we close today. God, we thank you so much for the reminder that we have in this message and the model that we have received from Nehemiah. One of the greatest feats I believe in all of scripture is what Nehemiah was able to do. A man who didn't have a degree in civil engineering, a man who uh, was not known to be an architect, a man who was not known to, to have the skills to do what he has done, but he sought you and you empowered him and you sent along the resources and you went before him and you gave him favor and you gave him protection. And so God, we are asking that you would help us to pause appropriately, but not permanently. And that at the appointed time that we would take the action that you have ordained and that you would go before us and that you would give us success, but the success that is according to your will. It's these things we ask in your son, Jesus name, amen. God bless.